All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the Prospect Heights Public Libraries program. Tonight, I'm Terry Campbell, your host. I wanna remind you that our Nature Speak series is in partnership with the Prospect Heights Natural Resource Commission. And we do four of these programs uh, every year. And the next one is coming up in January. We'll tell you more about that um, later on. But tonight we wanna welcome ecologists, horticulturists, botanists, and author of Native Plants for New England Gardens and Director of Applied Ecology at the Norcross Wildlife Foundation, Dan Jaffe Wilder. Welcome, Dan. Well, thank you, Terry. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm looking forward to this lecture. This is one that's near and dear to my heart. I've been killing lawns for quite a while now. Um, so we're gonna get right into this um, because I've, um, it's, it's eight o'clock by my time, I believe seven by yours. I'm hoping that this will just take us the hour, but I have a tendency to ramble when we talk about lawns. So I wanna kind of just jump right into it. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to stick them into the chat and we will deal with them at the end of the lecture. So what are we doing here today? Um, I wanna start by talking about lawns in a general sense um, and kind of discuss some of the issues that I see with kind of what I'll just describe as the kind of American lawn culture that I think a lot of us are familiar with to one extent or another. Um, I've got this idea that I call the gradients of ecology. And this is a way of looking at the options that we have when we talk about a lawn space. Running from on one end of the spectrum might be like your perfect like golf course style lawn to the other end of the spectrum being maybe a forest that was one day previously a lawn. And there's a lot of stuff in between. Um, we'll talk about how you treat your traditional lawn right. So assuming that, um, you know, I'm talking to folks who have a lawn and let's say I, I, I maybe get a little bit of a message across, but not that much. And you think, well, there's a few things I can do. Um, there are indeed a few things you can do. And there's a lot of small steps that each one of us can take that can really add up, especially when a lot of us start to do it. Um, We'll go from there into the non-native alternatives, the eco lawns, the clover lawns. Um, we're, we're not quite at what I'll call that, that kind of perfect level, but we're making some really good progress at this point. Um, we'll start digging then into native alternatives, um, things like strawberry lawns, carex lawns, um, a variety of others. Um, and then I'm gonna get into kind of the idea of, of a space that was once a lawn that maybe isn't any sort of lawn anymore. And as we start working our way through these different categories, you'll see that things will start to look different. Um, the first one's looking one heck of a lot like a standard lawn, maybe not like the picture here, but a standard lawn. And as you get down to the bottom, we're talking about turning a lawn into a forest and it's really not a lawn anymore. It's something completely different. So let's start with the problem. Um, why is it that I don't like lawns? Why am I giving a lecture that says kill your lawn? Um, for anyone who doesn't know, lawns are the largest, I spelled largest wrong. I'm just realizing that now. I've given this lecture so many times, never noticed that. Lawns are the laggest irrigated crop in the US, um, covering 50 million acres um, of the United States. It's roughly the size of Nebraska. Um, we grow more lawn than we grow corn, soy, and all fruit trees combined. Um, we spend $40 million on lawns annually and apply 3 million tons of synthetic fertilizer to lawns annually. So that's every single year, and we do this again and again. This picture on the right is something called the Gulf Dead Zone. Um, it's in the Gulf of Mexico. It's huge amounts of fertilizer runoff. Lawns are not the only problem here. There's a lot of you know, poor agricultural practices that have to do with this as well. Um, but you get this, this horrible thing called the dead zone where you get all this fertilizer runoff into the Gulf. You get massive algae blooms. Um, the algae then um, disrupts the light's ability to penetrate the water. Oxygen cycling shuts down and everything dies. Um, it's really not a good situation. We dump 60 million acre feet of, of water, mostly potable water on lawns annually. To put that into perspective, if we took just a tenth of that water um, and we're able to give it to everyone on the planet who's currently lacking clean drinking water, every one of those people would get seven gallons of water every single day. It's a huge amount of water that, that could go to some much better uses. So I talk to people a lot about lawns. I talk to people a lot about killing lawns. And one of the major reasons I hear against the, the, you know, my recommendation to remove a lawn is that my kids play on it, my pets play on it. I need space for our outdoor activities. Um, and then I look at what we put on our lawns. 
Um, of the 30 most commonly used pesticides, 16 of them are carcinogenic, 21 cause reproductive offense, 15 are neurotoxins, 13 cause birth defects, 25 cause liver or kidney damage. And the most common one that gets used in 90% of lawns that are treated with a pesticide um, is 2,4-D. And it does every one of these wonderful things. Um, this is a very, very, very regularly used pesticide. This is in every town in America. This is being applied every day in America. Um, most of us don't realize what's going on in terms of a lot of lawn treatments out there. Um, and this is the stuff that's on the town green, you know, where the kids go to play. Um, this is on a lot of soccer fields. This is, this is out there on a regular basis. Um, and when our kids come into contact with it or our pets come into contact with it, it's then brought back into the house through their feet. Um, and we all become in contact with this stuff. So on a larger scale, we're in what is unfortunately described as a biodiversity crisis. Um, we're looking at 40% of global insect species um, decline. That's coming from the journal Biological Conservation. 30% of North American bird species are in decline. That's the Journal of Science. We lose 13 million of hectares of forest every year. That's roughly the size of Greece on an annual basis. Um, that was from the UN. In the past 50 years, we've lost 68% of vertebrate species, which is a terrifying number. Um, that's the United Nations Biodiversity Summit. I'm not making these numbers up. Um, and so to be local to me, I know you guys are Ohio, but in my area, in Massachusetts, um, we have lost 25,000 acres to development in the past five years. And that includes 9,300 acres of what is considered high priority conservation land. Um, I don't know what your numbers are, but I'm gonna guess they're somewhere in that sort of range. Um, these are major problems. This is not a small issue. Um, and I can't lay lawn at every, you know, the, the lawn is not the only problem here. This, this is a much bigger issue than just lawns, um, but lawns are a big part of it. Um, habitat, um, so when, when I look at rare species, endangered species, a lot of the reason I do the work I do, um, there's, there's all of these reasons why a species might become rare or endangered. And the number one reason every single time is habitat loss. Um, and habitat loss is, is due to a number of factors, but development, um, large scale industrialized level sort of agriculture, housing tracks, um, these are where a lot of the habitat loss is going. Um, and we need to be realistic about this. I can't say stop building houses. That's not a realistic statement. And I can't say stop growing food. That's just as unrealistic. Um, what we need is good ways to do these things that we need to continue being able to do. Um, so that means smart development. That means, that means supporting your local farms. That means polycrop systems. Um, there's a lot of good agriculture out there. I've, I've been told before, I'm, I'm too hard on agriculture. Um, I'm, I'm hard on industrialized level agriculture that causes huge amounts of habitat loss, um, but I'm no fool. Um, I am to a very small extent, a, a home scale farmer. I have a lot of friends who are farmers and when it's done right, it can be a boom for habitat. Um, and that's what I wanna see more of. So how do we combat habitat loss um, on a general kind of person by person basis, support local land conservation and build habitat where you can build habitat. One of my major tripes with lawn is that it's a waste of space. Um, forget all of the problems with the lawns, the pesticides and the water waste and all that. I look at the lawn and I think, geez, that area could be habitat. It's not concrete. Um, it's not currently a house or a driveway or a road or a business or one of these things we need. It could be wildflowers. It could be forest. It could be a native lawn alternative. Um, this is a place for every one of us, or at least a lot of us, to build little pieces of habitat in our own back or front yards. So what can we each do? I've done the doom and gloom of this section. Let's get into some positive stuff. Um, you can kill your lawn. Um, and I tend to like to make that statement because it catches people's eye. Um, that being said, I don't like the dogmatic approach. Um, so what I'm gonna give you today are tools. Um, if you wanna kill your entire lawn and reforest it, I will give you the tools to do that. But in most cases, what I wanna see people do is just treat their lawn a little bit differently. Maybe reduce it by 10%, maybe plant a few more native plants. There's a lot of these really small steps that are very doable and they really do add up. Um, so if you get all fired up after today's lecture and then you think, geez, I don't know if I wanna kill my whole lawn, that is perfectly fine. Do a little bit. 
maybe next year you do a little bit more. Maybe the year after you say, you know what, I got a lot going on this year and I'll, I'll wait a year and maybe do a little bit more the following season. There's nothing wrong with these small steps. And that's what I want to give you today. So as I mentioned, we're going to talk about these gradients of ecology, this kind of steps that we can take. Um, and that starts with on the, the top of the list. I should really put this on the bottom of the list, but the top of the list is what's called, you know, the perfect lawn. And this is your classic, like perfect golf course style lawn. So it's a complete monoculture. It's nothing but turf grass. Um, this is this is treated with pesticides. This is mowed way too often. This is irrigated. This is all the things that, frankly, the people in this audience are probably not doing, but I'm sure you know someone who does or you drive by the golf course. Um, and, and again, I, I tend to knock on golf courses. They're not all bad. There's some pretty cool ones out there that are doing some pretty good things. But the traditional mental image of that perfect golf course lawn. Um, as you start working your way down, you've got the idea of a traditional European turf grass lawn that's being treated in a more sustainable manner. That is probably the smallest, easiest step that any one of us can take, and it can make a huge difference. Um, from there, we get into our LOMO options and non-native replacements, um, things like LOMO lawn, NOMO lawn, ECO lawn, ECO grass. There's 100 different versions of them out there. They're all roughly the same. Um, and eventually, we get into native alternatives. What's not on this list is, is converting a lawn into something completely different. So for this list, we're talking about it's still a lawn. The, the, the native alternative is, depending on which one we choose, it's going to look very different. I got one that still looks pretty lawn-like. Um, but, you know, a strawberry lawn is, is going to look very different from a traditional lawn. But all of these, you know, options here are, to one extent or another, still a lawn. They're going to grow reasonably low. They're going to be walkable to one extent or another. Um, they, they are going to be a lawn, kind of. Okay, so let's start with the easy stuff. How do you treat your traditional lawn right? Um, I call this the plight of Kentucky bluegrass. So um, turf grasses um, are, are a mix of things. There's a lot of different species that are used. They really range from one region to the next, but Poa pretensis, Kentucky bluegrass, is the most common one, and it's in most mixes. You know, most lawns are actually a mix of a couple different species. Um, Poa pretensis is the biggest one. Um, it's named Kentucky bluegrass. It's not from Kentucky. Um, it's uh, the epicenter of it is the United Kingdom. It expands into Scotland, Ireland, Wales. It gets into, um, uh, oh, where does it get into? It gets into Spain and France. I don't know if it gets into Asia at all. I'd have to check that. But either way, it's not a local native species. Um, what it's where it comes from is an area that gets a lot more water than we do. I mean, we get a lot of water in, in you know, the, the, the Northeast, and I'll lump you folks in Ohio easily into my broad spectrum of the Northeast, even though it's probably not accurate. But either way, we get a lot of rain. Um, our, our, our soils are not completely depleted of nutrients, um, yet none of what we've got is what this plant is used to in its native range. It gets a lot more you know, rain in the UK, and it's got a very different nutrient system, mostly a, a higher pH that allows for more easy access to nutrients. So we take this plant that doesn't tend to do well around here and we stick it out in our lawns. Um, and in order for it to do well, we need to water it and we need to fertilize it. Um, so we give it food, we give it water. Um, the weird thing is, God forbid the stuff actually starts to do well and grow, we immediately break out mowers and we cut the thing down to size. And what that does is it, it stops the plant's ability to develop a good root system. Um, all plants on this planet, to one extent or another, are going to be in a balance, a balance of, of, you know, above ground and below ground growth. You can't have a huge crown on a plant and no root system, and you can't have a huge root system with no, you know, above ground leafy material. Um, and so we've got this plant that doesn't get enough water, doesn't get enough nutrients, and doesn't get the chance to grow a good root system where it can then pick up more water and nutrients. So we're stuck in this cycle where a plant's just kind of always struggling to survive, and we are, are pretty much keeping it on life support. And then with a plant that's constantly struggling to survive comes all sorts of problems. Um, and when you look at a lot of these problems, you know, you go to the lawn care company and say that I've got, you know, I've got blight or I've got crabgrass or I've got, you know, kind of plantains growing. The solutions to these problems always treat the problem, but not the underlying source of the problem. You know, if, if we've got, you know, uh, plantains growing, um, they will come in with an herbicide that will spray and, and kill all the broadleaf plantains. Um, what doesn't tend to get happen is addressing the compaction issue that is causing the plantain growth. It doesn't address the fact that mowing height is too low and that's favoring plantain over the grass. Um, there's a lot of things we can do to just improve the soil conditions, which will then improve the plants, whether they be Kentucky bluegrass 
or a native species. Um, and when we improve the soil conditions, the plants grow more robustly and then they require less water, less fertilizer and less mowing from us, um, which is a step in the right direction. So how do we do it? Simplest thing anyone can do is adjust your mowing height. Um, the vast majority of lawns out there are getting mowed lower than they should be. Um, we've got this thought that if we mow it really low, it'll, you know, we, we don't have to mow it as often or it looks cleaner or, or somehow it's better. There's a lot of kind of thoughts that really aren't backed up by any actual real information. Um, mowing should be done at, at three and a half inches minimum. I push for four when I can. And frankly, if you can go higher, go for it. The higher you mow, the more robust of a root system you're gonna have underneath those mowed plants. And more robust of a root system means the plants can take up water and nutrients more effectively without us constantly having to give them water and nutrients. Um, so adjust your mowing height, mow higher. Um, it's better for the plants. Aerate if needed. If compaction is a problem, aeration can be a, a, a massive boon in changing how things go. And if compaction is only a light problem, uh, top dressing of compost will act to aerate your soil. It's a slower process than an actual physical aerator, but it works just fine. And for most kind of home lawns, compaction is usually a minor issue and not a major issue. You know, if you're out at, at the town green or you're working on the golf course or you're working in an area where turf is, say, your paths amongst gardens and there's lots of foot traffic, you might need something more intense. Um, and that's where you can go with mechanical aeration. And this can be done in a number of different ways, but frankly, most aerators are available for rental through rental centers, and it's something most people can get their hands on without much difficulty. You don't actually need to go out and buy one of these things. Um, the other option is you can actually get, and they actually have been shown to work quite well, you can get what amounts to spikes that attach to the bottom of your shoes and you walk around on your lawn. Um, and it sounds pretty stupid and it looks pretty stupid, but it actually works really well. Um, so if you're kind of getting past that compost level of aeration, go out and buy some spikes um, or rent an aerator, and this will make a big difference. Finally, my favorite thing to do with traditional lawns is embrace the weeds. Um, so we've been taught um, by, by a, a lot of different lawn care companies, Scott's is great is their, in their advertising, um, that, that a lot of these plants are weeds. And I wanna kind of rephrase the idea for a moment. So imagine you've got two options. You've got an area that is low and is green, and that's option one. Or you've got an area that's low and is green with splashes of purple and white and pink and yellow and red in it. Which would you choose? Um, the idea that so many of these plants are weeds is, is really wrong. Um, you know, there, there are lots of plants that will grow in a lawn that are really quite beneficial, both to the lawn itself, to the nutrients of the system, as well as to a variety of pollinators and wildlife. And frankly, they look nice. Um, so a couple of my favorite lawn weeds that I think are better than most lawns. Um, violets are by no means a weed. I don't know why we were ever taught they were. Um, they are fantastic plants. The vast majority of the violets that you find randomly growing in the lawn are natives. Um, there's an English violet, which is not native, which is reasonably common, but is not at all problematic. It's a whole lot less problematic than lawns are. Um, and violets are really valuable on the landscape. Um, there's a lot of, of some of our, our less common and in, in some cases common, but just wonderful um, Lepidoptera, namely our butterflies or moths that require violets in their younger caterpillar stages. Um, a lot of fritillaries require um, violets. And if you're not sure what a fritillary is, type in regal fritillary to Google and you're gonna see a picture of a lovely butterfly um, and they require violets. There's a lot of different species out there um, identifying them is usually quite problematic and then frankly doesn't matter. It's whether it's pink or yellow or white in your lawn, either way it looks nice. Um, some of the common ones in, in my region at least, um, we've got a lot of blue violets in our area. Most of them are this one on the right, Viola sororia. This one is common in Ohio. In fact, both of these are common in your area as well. Um, Viola sororia, the woolly blue violet. I always tell people that are struggling with violet ID, if you see a blue violet, announce it as viola sororia, you'll probably be right about 65, 70% of the time. It is an extremely common species. Um, it's a wonderful plant. It's very easy to grow. Um, it's got a lot of benefits on the landscape, both for the caterpillars, the butterflies, and the bees. Um, if you've got really, really sandy soils, there's a pretty good chance you've got viola sagittata, the sand violet. It's actually really well named. Um, this one grows in sandy soils, gravelly soils. I see this growing next to sweet fern and little blue stem. Um, lovely species. 
Easily one of my favorite lawn weeds, Houstonia cerulea. This plant goes under the name Bluets, sometimes Quaker ladies, sometimes no pista beds because it's got some medicinal value as a diuretic or as an antidiuretic. I can never remember which is which. I'm a plant guy, not a medicine guy. Um, this is a lovely plant though. This is just a short, adorable thing. And the nice thing about this is it's a plant that a lot of people likely already have in their lawns. Um, but a lot of people don't know they have it because if you mow regularly, especially in the early season, you never see the flowers. Um, so a lot of times what we tell people is don't mow until say June 1st. It's pretty easy to get away with not mowing till June 1st. And you'll see a lot of stuff start showing itself if it's got a chance to produce a flower. Bluets are often a, a common one. Um, and once you see a lot of these around, you can start to mark the areas and just let them bloom. Um, let them go past the bloom into seed and then you get more of them on your landscape and you got more of these lovely plants around. This is the, uh, the bluets. This is a, a moss lawn out in Mount Cuba Center down in, uh, it's in Delaware, I believe. Um, and the, the, the moss lawn is as much blue it's, as it is moss. It's a lovely place. All right, so let's get out of treating you know, traditional lawns well and start talking about some, some non-traditional lawn alternatives. Um, there are some really good non-native alternatives out there that we will talk about before we get to native alternatives. Um, they tend to go under the name eco lawn. There's a couple different forms of it out there. Excuse me. And they're all various different mixes of cool season they're fescues. Um, and I find a lot of people are confused by this cool season, warm season thing. I'll teach you a really easy way to know. When you hear cool season, when you hear warm season, whatever season we're talking about, cool or warm, that's the time of year it's growing. So cool season is growing when it's cool out, as in spring and fall. Warm season is growing when it's warm out, which pretty much means summer. In general, most of the European turf grasses are warm season plants. And most of our native grasses are cool season plants. It's not 100%, but it's a pretty good general. Um, so the nice thing about a lot of these cool season fescues is the, the majority of the mowing that traditional lawns need is in the summer. That's when they're putting on all their growth. If we switch our warm season grasses over to cool season grasses, all of a sudden the need to mow drops drastically. Um, you know, growth is in the spring and in the fall when things are cool and the growth is happening a lot more slowly. Um, so in these areas, you can usually get away with mowing them once, twice a year, or sometimes not at all, depending on your conditions and your goals. Um, I usually recommend mowing at least once every two years if you want to maintain it as lawn. Um, otherwise, at least in my area, you get tree seedlings and eventually it turns back to forest. Um, and you might like that, and that might be a good thing. But if you're trying to maintain it as lawn, you want to mow it at least every now and then. Um, but we go from mowing what is often, you know, well, I was actually looking it up the, the other day, the average American spends 72 hours a year mowing, um, which, which seems like an extreme waste of time to me. Um, but we could mow for 72 hours a year, or we could mow once or twice a year. Um, I like the once or twice. I frankly don't enjoy mowing. These eco lawns require no water or fertilizer once they're established. Um, they don't need ever, any fertilizer ever, but they definitely need watering when they're establishing. Um, and the nice thing about these is these are adapted to thin soils. Um, so when you've got a lot of lawns that fail, fail because we've got this really nasty practice of when we're building new houses, we strip off all the topsoil, we build the house, um, and then you know we come back six months later and offer to sell topsoil to the new homeowners. Um, and what we've got is we're down to mineral soils, and the turf grasses don't grow well in mineral soils. They need good soil. And you go to the store and they say you need, you know, a minimum of six inches, recommended 18 inches of topsoil. And you look at what putting 18 inches of topsoil on an acre is and you see the costs and all of a sudden we've all got two inch topsoil lawns and they're not doing very well. Um, these cool season fescues do just fine with that or even in mineral soil. Um, two varieties that I've worked with, Eco Lawn, which is available through Prairie Moon, um, eco grass available through Wildflower Farm. They're both great mixes. Um, they've worked well for me when I've worked with them. There's a lot of other options out there these days, and they're all roughly the same. I've not seen any that that deviate much from the mean, um, which is a mix of cool season fescues and a few other plants as well. Another different option is white clover. Um, white clover lawns are getting pretty popular. Um, white clover's got some advantages um, over, you know, kind of traditional lawn. It's got some disadvantages over native lawns, but frankly, it's not a half bad option. Um, it is semi-shade tolerant. It is, it is pretty darn drought tolerant. It's a nitrogen fixer, um, which is pretty much just a fancy way of saying it produces its own fertilizer. Um, so like the eco lawns above, it, it really doesn't need um, 
much water at all. It does not need fertilizing. Depending on how tall or what variety of white clover you require, the mowing regimen varies quite a bit. Um, but anyway, even the highest mowed white clover lawn needs to be mowed a whole lot less than a traditional turf grass lawn. Um, so it's a pretty good option. I'll talk a little bit about the ecology of these um, as we get a little further along. Um, but the, the, there's advantages and disadvantages to every one of these options, um, ecology being one of them. Um, the, the two major advantages to these non-native options is time and cost. Um, I will get into in a moment planting native lawns and the time and cost for planting native lawns will always be higher than the time and cost for planting these um, you know, non-native um, lawn replacements. These are, are available in one to two seasons, um, depending on how you do it and your conditions. Um, and they can be sown as seed. You can go to the hardware store, or go online and order a bag of, of white clover seed or this eco lawn mix, and you can throw it down on your landscape, follow the instructions, but you can throw it down on your landscape and you will have a lawn in one to two seasons. You can't do that with any of my native alternatives, not yet at least. Um, I have options for kind of working my way around it, but the natives will always cost you more and take longer to establish with what we currently have available to us. Um, the disadvantages on these, you know, non-native alternatives is really ecological. Um, they are, are definitely a major step up from a traditional lawn, um, but they've pretty much gotten to the point where they're not really creating much habitat, maybe a little bit, especially for the clover, a little bit. Um, but they're not really doing much great on the landscape. They're doing a whole lot less bad than the traditional lawn, um, which is why I am happy to support these any day of the week. And this is a very doable option for a lot of people, um, but it's not as good as the natives. Let's talk about the natives. Um, what if you could have a lawn that looked like this without any watering, mowing or fertilizer? This is actually the same plant twice. It was just mowed in on the right side and left tall on the left. Um, this is Carex Pennsylvanica. This picture here is what it looks like roughly around June 1st if it's left completely unmowed. Um, this is it growing at Norcross in dense shade without any, any water, any fertilizer, or really any nutrients in this soil. Um, this is a, a very shade tolerant species. It is the most shade tolerant species of anything we're going to talk about today. Um, so if you've got a, you know, a, a lawn with trees and it's really thin underneath the trees, this is a really good option for you. This is what the lawn will look like if you plant it and don't mow it all for the season. This is as tall as it'll ever get. Um, you know, each blade of grass is probably about nine inches long, but as you can see, it kind of, you know, bends over at the top. And so the lawn will stand probably about five to five and a half, maybe six inches tall. Um, it's got what I tend to just describe as a lush lawn look. And I, I like this look and I don't see the need to mow this, but I do recommend mowing it at least once a year, once every other year, if you want to keep it as lawn, um, and stop the tree seedlings from taking over and going back to forest. What's interesting about this is this is a native sedge. It's not technically a grass, but to all, to all equal parties, it, it pretty much is. It at least looks like one. Um, so it produces a flower that's never visited by an, a pollinating insect. Um, so you would think, oh, well, it's not gonna have a ton of ecological value. But this plant here, Carex pennsylvanica, um, is the host plant for 36 different um, native caterpillars that turn into native butterflies and moths. Um, this one plant here is more valuable to pollinators than a lot of pollinator gardens as a whole are. Um, and it's because we, we tend to forget about the fact that the, you know, the, the butterfly starts as a caterpillar. Um, and caterpillars, for the most part, don't care about flowers. They're eating leaves. Um, and blades of graminoid, of sedge, of grass, are leaves. Um, this is good food. And so you actually find that despite the fact that you don't see a lot of bees visiting this, you don't see a lot of butterflies visiting this, this is still a huge ecological step forward. And if you get down on your hands and knees and you start looking in there, you will find all these little caterpillars feeding away. Um, and eventually they will you know, move off and pupate and turn into native butterflies. Downsides on this one is time and cost. Downsides of, of all these are gonna be time and cost. This is the, the slowest and the most expensive of my options today. Um, it is also the most shade tolerant and it looks the most like a traditional lawn. So there's, there's checks and balances on this. Um, it's going to take three to four years to plant this from scratch and you need to plant this. Um, this is a, a pain in the butt to germinate from seed. Us fancy professional propagators are, are still struggling 
to get this one to Germany consistently. We do a lot of funny things to it. We pour boiling water on it. We treat it with acid. It's got to get very special cold, moist periods. Um, so as a general homeowner or someone looking to replace their lawn, the way to do this is to kill your lawn and start planting plugs. Um, and that's what an LP32 means. Um, LP is, is a, a size, a 32 is 32 plugs per tray. Um, so what that means is the plugs are pretty big, $1.90 per plug, they're roughly, that, that, that doesn't help, that big in size. Um, you know, we'll talk about um, 50s, we won't talk about 72s today. 72 is a really small plug, 32 is a really big plug, 50 is your standard. Um, so $1.90 per plug, these need to get planted out in the landscape, it gets expensive quickly. The nice thing about this plant and all of the other native alternatives that I'll talk about now is that they all spread rhizomatically, um, which means when you plant one, it spreads underground and then produces more stems above. So if you're thinking about doing an area with this, you can do a small area, get it established, and then instead of buying new plugs for the next area, you can just take chunks out of the old area and put them in the new area. The old area will fill back in, that rhizome will do its job, and the new area will start to grow as well. Um, so it allows you to kind of leapfrog along, which is a method I really like um, because it's a whole lot easier than trying to tackle the whole lawn in one fell swoop. Um, I want this to be doable for folks. So try and do maybe 5%, 10% of your lawn edges. Maybe the area's right underneath the canopy trees. You know, you can kind of piecemeal this and you can work your way out from there. This is probably my favorite, the wild strawberry lawn. Um, for Gary or Virginiana, this is our native wild strawberry. Um, this is a powerhouse of a ecological plant. There are 87 different species of caterpillars that will feed on this plant in my region. Um, your region is going to be pretty similar. It might be 93, it might be 81, but it's going to be roughly, you know, Ohio and then Massachusetts are not that far apart when you start talking about ecological systems. Um, um, Dan, and this, can I, I interrupt you one second? Go we're, ahead. In, we're in Illinois, not Ohio. You're in Illinois. Why did I yes. think you're in Ohio? Jeez. Illinois. All right, well, your, your numbers are still going to be pretty same. You know, instead of 93, you might be at 95. Instead of 81, you might be at 78. Um, you're still not that far away from an ecological point of view. We're, we're sharing ecoregions, um, if you get to level three at least. Um, so what I'm saying is that this plant is an extremely valuable plant from an ecological point of view. You've got a huge amount of caterpillars that feed on these leaves. And then you've got not a lot of specialist bees, but you've got a bunch of generalist bees that will feed upon those flowers. And then the fruits that form later are wonderful for a bunch of birds, small mammals, and me, and my dog, and my wife, and any human that likes a strawberry, which is most of us, as far as I can tell. So this is what your lawn would look like in spring. You get flowers. Nice thing for a lawn to do, right? I don't understand why we're so obsessed with grass. It's really quite boring when it comes down to it. Um, so here is the strawberry lawn that I planted at Norcross Wildlife Foundation where I work. Um, this was the first year. So we planted this lawn in the spring. Um, you can't really see the strawberries all that well behind, but you can get a general sense of it. Um, you know, you see a lot of space in between there, as in the, the lawn is just starting to fill in. It hasn't really done much of it just yet. Um, but you can see that light green color. That's a new growth. Things are going well. I actually got strawberries out of it the first year. I didn't expect strawberries the first summer after planting. Um, so there's year one. Year two in spring, um, you can still see a little bit of soil kind of showing in there, but for the most part, it's starting to really fill in nicely now. Not complete coverage, but but I'd say, you know, visually, we're at probably 85% coverage with just a couple spots in between. The fun thing is, year two in spring is the perfect moment where the plants are, are not yet really competing with each other, but they put on a lot of growth. So you will get the largest berries in your second spring than you will get out of this lawn for the rest of this lawn's life, unless you go in there and literally dig up chunks and allow it to refill back in, um, which actually is a good option for planting new lawns, but most people don't do that. Um, you'll get more berries in future seasons, but they'll be smaller. Um, so year two of the lawn is, is kind of a year to celebrate. This is that same lawn, the fall this, of the second season. So at this point, it is fully filled in. It took two years and it's fully filled in. Um, it looks phenomenal in fall. My flowers are gone, my berries are gone, and now I've got fall color. Um, this is something you'll get in any area with good sun exposure, which is where most of our lawns are. Um, so you've got a plant that is hugely ecologically valuable. It feeds us, it feeds the wildlife, and you can abuse the living daylights out of wild strawberries. Um, the previous plant, Carex pennsylvanica, the Pennsylvania sedge, can handle some light foot traffic, but it's never going to take the place of a soccer field. 
Um, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to really walk on it on any sort of constant regular basis. Wild strawberry, you can. You can abuse the living daylights out of this plant. It is pretty much a weed. Um, but in this case, it's a really, really nice, useful, tasty, edible pollinator powerhouse of a weed, um, which I think means it's probably not considered a weed anymore. Um, but this is my go-to plant um, for a lot of areas where I know there's going to be a lot of human interaction. Um, so this is the lawn we are planting under our orchard out front. We've got apple trees, we've got cherry trees, we've got pawpaws, and it's wild strawberry underneath. Um, and that works well because we are constantly walking throughout the orchard. We're checking our trees, we're harvesting, we're weeding, you know, we're doing whatever we need to do. Um, and this plant can handle the abuse. It can handle the free range chickens. It can handle the dog that likes to dig holes and it can handle us having garden parties. Abuse tolerant plant. It's nice to have those. This one is, is, again, not one you can just throw down seed. I think if we ever could go to the hardware store and buy a 50 gallon bag of seed, you could probably do that, but that, that's not available. Um, so you're looking to plant plugs again. Um, and like the previous one, you could plant a small section and then leapfrog along. Plugs on this one are quite a bit cheaper. So 95 cents for a 50 cell of plugs. Um, so 50 plugs, 95 cents per plug. And you, you get bulk discounts when you buy them in, in trays. Um, and this takes, you know, I've, I've not actually seen one that took three years to establish, but if, if we're talking about ready for full scale abuse, that's when I'm going to go for three years. Um, but this thing looks good in two years, completely filled in, looking good to go, producing berries. Okay, option number three for native plant lawns. This is Prunella vulgaris subspecies lanceolata. That subspecies part is actually somewhat important here. Um, we have a Prunella vulgaris subspecies lanceolata, American selfiel sometimes called American heel all. Um, there's also Prunella vulgaris subspecies vulgaris. That's the European self heel or the European heel all. Um, part of the reason why I like the American one is the American one being our local species is gonna more have ecological value, but also the American species is a true season wide perennial. Um, whereas the, the European subspecies often acts as an ephemeral species. And what I mean by that is it goes dormant in the summer. And a plant that goes dormant in the summer is not going to be a very effective lawn. Um, our native species does not do that. It runs right through the summer, right through the fall. I'll show you a picture in a moment that I took yesterday. Um, so this is, you get these different color forms on this running from purple to pink to occasionally pure white to sometimes really blue. Um, I don't know how many people notice that we tend to lie in horticulture all the time. We tell you we've got a blue plant. It's actually purple. We tell you we have red. It's actually pink. Um, Prunella vulgaris, most of it will be in the purple pink spectrum, but you will find true blue variants, which is really kind of cool. Um, it is probably one of the easiest plants in the world to grow from, from seed. Um, so if, if you've never taken a hand at propagation and feel like giving it a try, this is a great one. Um, what, what I'm showing in this picture is I literally took a plug tray. That's a 50 cell, by the way, for anyone wondering. Um, I filled it up with soil. I collected Prunella vulgaris seed and I just sprinkled seed into each tray and then did nothing. I put it outside for the winter and come spring, it looks like that. Um, and those plants are growing, they get big, I plant them out. Um, you can even divide those, I over sowed it. I didn't expect it to germinate that well. Really, really easy. You know, none of that crazy, you know, boiling water, acid treatment, any of that. Just sprinkle seed in some trays, leave it outside for the winter, come spring, you have plants. This is it kind of growing in. Um, and this is the picture that I took. It was this yesterday, it was the day before yesterday at Norcross in our, we've got a little um, uh, lawn replacement display where we've got these little kind of pretty much postage stamps, but they show you what different lawn alternatives could look like. Um, this is it here. This is, um, this is the end of year one and it has filled in. Um, Part of that is that it grows very quickly. Part of it is that it grows quickly in this site. And part of it is that we planted it much tighter than I would normally recommend. Um, you can plant it this tight and it can fill in this quickly. The only reason I wouldn't recommend it is it just costs you more because you need more plants. Um, and you could spread it out and it'll fill in just as effectively. Um, so two to three years from scratch, if you're planting at what I would recommend as recommended spacing where you're not spending you know, your entire endowment on this plant. Um, I don't have prices for you on this one because I can't find it available. Um, I know that North Creek Nurseries is starting to grow this one. I know that Ernst Seed is starting to grow this one. I know Prairie Moon is already growing this one. None of them have them available yet. I would be surprised if they're not available by next season. It's kind of an up and coming plant. Um, it's one that's been ignored for a long time. Enough people like me are screaming about it these days where the companies are listening and they're starting to grow it out. Um, 
So at the moment, if you want it, you either got to grow it yourself, collect seed, or come talk to someone like me, and I'm happy to give away plants. Um, but I expect by the end of this season, I can put a price on this plant. And if not the end of this coming season, definitely by the end of next one. Um, I know a lot of folks who are growing this one to a large scale, as in we're going to have, you know, 50,000 plugs available next year. Please, customers, come buy them. Okay. So we've been talking about these different gradients of ecology. I want to do it on a species by species basis here. What do these different plants offer us from an ecological point of view? So Kentucky bluegrass, this is your standard turf grass. There is absolutely no value to bees. In fact, there's an argument that this kills a lot of bees, depending on how you're treating it. It is the host plant for one native caterpillar. This is the grass skipper. Um, this is a species that'll host on just about any grass out there. So it definitely doesn't need poa pretensis. Um, it'll just make use of it if it's there. But if you're mowing it regularly, you're probably mowing those caterpillars. White clover, this is a pretty good option for a non-native species. Um, medium value to generalist bees. You're not gonna get any of the real specialized bees showing up on this one, but medium value to generalist bees is a massive step forward from the Kentucky bluegrass we were just talking about. Um, this is a host plant for at least two native caterpillars. Um, I'm gonna say likely more. So this host plant data is, is, is missing, honestly. Um, we have a lot of really good host plant data these days. Um, I definitely gotta put a shout out to Doug Tallamy and his grad students for doing a ton of work and making this information available. Um, but no one's really studied a lot of these plants. Prunella vulgaris, I'll talk about that one in a moment. No one studied it. I have no idea who's hosting on it just yet. Um, and white clover is one that hasn't been studied in terms of native to our area species. That being said, um, in, in Maryland and Delaware, possibly in Illinois as well, I'd have to look it up. There's a lot more native clovers than I've got in my region. Um, and they, those native clovers are extremely valuable ecologically. Um, in fact, if you go down to, I think you get into the Virginias, clover becomes more valuable than goldenrod, which in my region is by far the most valuable form, herbaceous plant that you'll find in the area. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm gonna say likely more native caterpillars that will recognize this one as food, even though it's not actually a native species, but that's just a guess. Red fescue, Festuca rubra, this is both native or exotic, depending on which subspecies you've got your hands on. If you're buying red fescue seed, you're buying the non-native subspecies. Um, I know the native subspecies is host to at least six different caterpillars. My guess is some of those would likely be comfortable eating the non-native subspecies. But again, it's a guess. No real value to bees on this one. Um, the major upgrade on this plant as compared to Poa pretensis is... The, the need to mow is, is next to non-existent. The need to water and fertilize is next to non-existent. So it's really about reducing harm instead of necessarily about building a lot of ecosystem. Um, when we start building ecosystem, we start talking about plants like woolly blue violet. Um, medium value to bees, mainly generalists, no specialists that I know of, but this is a host plant to at least 30 different native caterpillars, including some very specialized species. Um, there's some really cool butterflies out there that must have violets. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's amazing that that can be a lawn plant for us. Pennsylvania sedge, I mentioned this one earlier, minimal to no value to bees. I actually have seen bees visiting it every now and then, but it's a rare occurrence. It's mostly a wind pollinated flower, um, but a host plant of 36 different caterpillars, again, including quite a few specialists. Some real great value there. Wild strawberry, probably the king of this hill, 87 different native caterpillars that will feed on that one. Um, value to native generalist bees. Um, this one has the added bonus of the berries, um, whether that be value to us because we like eating strawberries or value to chipmunks and birds because they like eating strawberries. Um, it's the only plant of, of this group that produces a fleshy berry. Um, that being said, that Pennsylvania sedge, the birds will eat that seed as well. American heel oil, Prunella vulgaris subspecies lanceolata. Um, we have data on this one for bees. There's a guy out our way called Robert Gagier. Um, he's doing some really amazing bee research. He's also got some phenomenal grad students that are adding to that bee research. Um, Prunella vulgaris is one of the plants on his top five list in terms of value for some really specialized, really rare native bees. Um, if you want to support native rare bees, this plant should be on your list. Um, there is no current data that I've been able to find on its value as a host plant, as in caterpillars eating the leaves. Um, I'm going to say it's likely pretty low, though. It, it is a member of the mint family, and the mint family produces all of these really interesting anti-insectivory compounds. 
it's ironic that these compounds that are made to stop insects from eating the plants are exactly the same compounds that make us want to eat the plants. So when a mint smells minty or a bee bomb smells bee bomby, we'll make that a word, you're smelling compounds that are meant to stop things from eating them. Um, and there is that in this plant. Um, so that's why I'm going to say it's likely low value from a host plant point of view. Um, but the value to specialist bees on this one is, is higher than anything else we'll talk about today. Um, Houstonia, um, this one value-wise is, is middle. Um, you know, it's, in terms of native plants, it's not all that strong, stronger than all the non-natives though. Uh, medium value to early season native bees. There's some specialization in the small Adrena mining bees that'll show up in this one. Um, another one with no current data on host plant value. Um, another one that I think is probably likely low. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with this plant. I spend a lot of time looking at this plant and I've never seen a caterpillar on it. Um, and, and not that that is, you know, a hard, fast data point right there, but I feel like I would have run into some at this point if there was a lot of them on there. So a guess again, but likely low. Okay. And then the question becomes, why does it need to be a single species? Um, you know, a traditional lawn is that single species, or at least the look of one. And a lot of the lawn alternatives up to this point have been a strawberry lawn, a selfie lawn, a carex lawn. Um, but depending on your situation and, and what you've got available to you, you could very well just do a mixed planting that could be your lawn. Um, and what you choose is going to depend greatly on your conditions, which is why I've got this list out here. And this is available as a handout. Um, I sent it out earlier. I don't know how many people got it or didn't. If you don't have it, I'm happy to make it available um, or reach out to the library. And I, I think they now have a copy. So you're going to want to pay attention to the specifics on this list. You can't just say, I want a GM, a heuchera, and an iris. Um, because your foot traffic tolerance, your spread rate, and your conditions are going to change everything depending on where you are. You know, if, if you're in full sun and dry soils, you want to plant plants that can do full sun and dry soils. And if you pick plants that are really low spread rate and put them right next to an even amount, something with a very high spread rate, you know, let's say we stuck some dwarf iris next to the Canada Mayflower, um, in a couple of years, you're going to have a lot of Canada Mayflower and not too much dwarf iris. So if you want those two together, you plant three times as much dwarf iris to one part of the Canada Mayflower, and they end up kind of playing nicely together in the long term. But you got to kind of think it through a little bit. Um, or you can do what I do and just shove a whole bunch of species into an area and say, whatever survives, survives, and you get a whatever survives, which always becomes a mix of species and is, is rarely what I expect it to be, but is usually at least somewhat close to what I expect it to be. And it's kind of fun to just let it happen. Um, foot traffic obviously is going to affect things greatly. I find that most people don't actually need to walk on their lawn regularly. Um, you know, when I talk to people about lawns um, and they say, you know, oh, I, I need something that can handle a lot of foot traffic. My kids like to play soccer on it. And I say, oh, really? You know, how old are your kids? And they say, well, the youngest is 38 and he hasn't lived here for 15 years. So I guess my kids don't need to play soccer on it anymore. And it's kind of this light bulb moment. Um, so if you just need to pretty much have something low and neat looking in your front yard, you can go with any of these low foot tolerance plants. If you do have kids who play soccer on your lawn, or it's, it's a lawn underneath an active orchard or some other place where you're going to be actively working on it, you're looking at the medium to high, you know, kind of tolerance plants. Okay. Um, as I said, the list is available. So um, getting out of lawns a little bit and starting to look at some other options. Um, can your lawn be reduced? What are you actually doing with your lawn? Why do you need it? Um, if you don't really need it, that's when you could start saying, maybe my lawn could be gardens. Maybe all the lawn I need is just turf trails among gardens. Um, we do this at Norcross to an extent. Our, our turf trails aren't really European turf grasses, but we do things like wild strawberries and, and mixes of other species. And these, these lawn areas, as best they are, are pretty much our pathways amongst natural areas, garden areas, meadows, and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of people look at their area and say, you know what, yeah, I could expand gardens and I can make my turf in between. It's not for everyone, but it's an option. I often like to ask people to kind of take a map of their property. It doesn't need to be a fancy one. You know, do a Google images, just kind of screenshot and look at your lawn and say, what parts of this lawn do I not really need? Because in a pretty quick period of time, I could say, you know what, I don't want that lawn right by the roadside. If my kids are playing on the lawn, I don't need to encourage them to be right on the roadside. And that big long strip in back, what is that doing for me? It's a pain to mow. I can get rid of that. And maybe that other little piece there. And all of a sudden, with very little thought, I've been able to reduce my lawn by 40%. Um, and this is something most people can do when you start looking at your lawn and look at how much of it you really use. 
you realize there's actually a lot of it you don't really use. That could be something else. What could that be? Um, that could be a lot of things. That could be trees, that could be gardens, that could be vegetables, that could be you know wildflowers. Or in many cases, what I find works well is to pick a single species, maybe two, maybe three, but find something you really like and make clusters of it as these edges. What it does very well is you've got your lawn, which is, is pretty formal to one extent or another, and you've got your gardens, which are mixes of plants that you put in there because you like them. And this single species planting is often a really nice transition. Um, it's more formal than a true garden, but less formal than a lawn. It requires little to no maintenance. So what do you plant? Um, prairie drop seed is one of my favorite choices. Um, this plant is probably pretty darn common out in your direction. It's pretty rare in Massachusetts, but it does well around here in a planted um, setting. Um, this is one of those plants that I always like to describe. This one flops lovely. Um, it's got a tendency, it, it starts off tall and standing up and then it kind of droops over and it almost looks like little waterfalls. Um, and then the flowers stick up in the middle. A really, really lovely grass, very slow growing. This is one for a patient person. Um, Little blue stem, a much faster growing grass, not very fast growing, but everything's faster than prairie drop seed. Um, this plant has, has a lovely uh, value of turning these lovely colors in fall. It's, it's kind of in fall beauty in my little blue stem meadows right now, and I'm enamored by it. I am every year this time of year. Um, yellow tick seed, this plant was really popular in the 80s. It seems to have gone out of style. I'm not sure why. I'm trying to bring it back. It's a, it's a tolerant, easygoing, kind of solid growing plant. It can just handle a lot of, of you know, tough conditions or a lot of different conditions, um, which makes it quite useful. Both this one, Anis hyssop, and this one, Broadleaf Mountain Mint, are ones that I often work with for this value. Um, the reason for this is that being on the edge of a lawn, these plants will sometimes creep into the lawn. And if you're mowing your lawn and you mow over anis hyssop or broadleaf mountain mint, you just immediately get bombarded with these lovely smells. It smells like sweet anise. It smells like mint. Um, it's a really nice plant to be occasionally hitting with the mower because it just you get all those aromatic compounds in the air. Um, it's quite lovely. The other option is to start going into trees, shrubs, gardens, and various other kind of wildlife friendly options. When you start reducing lawn, you get to start kind of playing with what would I do in that space? And maybe it's a lawn. Maybe it's a single planting, maybe it's a new garden, maybe it's a vegetable plot, you've got options. Okay, getting even more extreme. Let's talk about killing an entire lawn and doing a meadow. Um, this is something that's really been catching on a lot lately. I've been seeing more and more of these around, these kind of just front yard meadows. Um, oftentimes they are, you know, kind of mowed on the edges, usually a path mowed through the middle gives it a nice, uh, a nice kind of formal purposeful look, which I think is really valuable for a front yard meadow. Uh, most of these are usually kind of lower meadows, and that can be done a couple different ways. You can either pick plants that stay low, or a lot of times people will give this a mowing kind of like once during the growing season to kind of bring it down to size and it regrows and it allows it to stay short. Um, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. So how do you go from lawn to meadow? Um, most people like the idea of just not mowing and seeing what grows. Um, unfortunately, it usually doesn't work. Um, for most lawns, if you leave a lawn as it is and stop mowing it, all you end up with is a tall lawn. Um, you know, the Kentucky bluegrass actually goes to seed. It finally produces good roots, um, but then it seeds around and it just, it, it doesn't tend to work well. The times where I found this can work is when you've got a lawn that's doing really poorly already for one or two of these kind of extreme conditions. Either you've got a really wet area um, and the lawn is drowning and that will often just, the lawn will die and you'll get wetland species that emerge not too common for most lawns. The more common one though, is you've got really, really thin soils. Um, maybe the contractor stripped off all the topsoil before you bought the house, or maybe you just live in an area like me with a lot of glacial outwash, um, and you've got these very sandy soil conditions. These are not areas where lawns tend to do well. And if your lawn is already on the really thin, not so good side, and you just stop mowing it, there's a decent chance What'll start showing up will be things like asters and goldenrods and little blue stem and milkweeds, and you can actually get away with this. Um, that being said, that's maybe 5% of the people I've dealt with. The vast majority of us need to actually kill our lawn if we wanna kill our lawn. So what I mean by that is zeroing out, as in the lawn goes away and a new meadow gets put into place. Um, there are kind of two, maybe two and a half major ways that most people go about doing this. Um, there is solarizing and there is smothering. So solarizing, this is often confusing for people, but solarizing is using clear plastic, not black plastic, not cardboard, not anything else. You use clear plastic, the idea being that the sunlight actually penetrates the plastic. What this does is it 
at first it pretty much just builds a greenhouse and everything starts growing kind of crazy. And you're like, this isn't working. There was a bad idea. Um, but in a pretty short period of time, the, the sun gets pretty darn hot in there. The plants start to let off. They transpire. A lot of steam gets formed and you pretty much steam clean your lawn. Um, it's got the advantage of, of doing a pretty darn solid job of killing off both the, the above ground material, the root system, and the seed bank. Um, that's really valuable if you've got invasive species. That being said, depending on your conditions, solarizing can be problematic. Um, if you don't have really good sun, it doesn't tend to work well, which is where smothering comes in. Um, smothering is covering things either with cardboard is what I go with more often than not. There is a black plastic version I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, this is me smothering when I was doing it small scale. So, you know, these are boxes that I got from the local hardware store or, or the Amazon deliveries. I lay them out over the lawn. I cover it over with a mix of cardboard, or I'm sorry, of wood chips and compost and my lawn dies and I can plant, in this case, it was grapes. Um, the, the bed behind it was raspberries. The bed that's just in that bottom corner there was the blueberries. Worked well on a small scale. Um, I don't have my picture. Of, oh, it's because it goes away. All right. There's a, if you see it really quickly flashes a picture of Ramboard. Um, this thing is coming too quickly. So there's a product called Ramboard. Um, and there's various different forms of it. Um, the local one for me, it all seems to be Ramboard, but I've seen blanking on the other names. It's all pretty much the same. It's a, it's a product that a lot of painters use, a lot of contractors use. It's just a roll of cardboard. You can get it at any local hardware store. Um, and it uses floor protectant. You know, imagine you're painting the ceiling. You don't want to drip on the floor. You lay down these rolls of cardboard. I don't use it for that. Well, I actually do use it for that sometimes. I use it out on the landscape though. Um, it streamlines the cardboard process quite nicely. Um, these, these are, they're 36 inches wide. They come in 50 or hundred foot rolls and you can just roll them out on the landscape. I overlap them by about, you know, four to six inches depending on my conditions and what's growing underneath it. And I'll lay these out and it allows me to very quickly lay out large amounts of cardboard. Um, this is great if you've got a larger area to cover. And then if you start getting to my scale, this is at Norcross, so this is not home scale. This is, I have a five acre meadow that I'm trying to smother out. Um, in this case, it wasn't a lawn, it was a mugwort and bittersweet, um, invasive species. And we wanted to work with, you know, uh, try and experiment with non-herbicide treatments for invasive species control. And we use silage tarps. Um, these are, this is an agricultural product. Farmers use this to protect their silage. Um, I'm using it incorrectly for, from the farming point of view, you flip it around so it's white side up. For our purposes, we want black side up so it absorbs sunlight um, and we lay it out over this area. Um, and this is done to smother out all of the underground stuff. You know, no sun getting through, no moisture getting through, um, everything dies and then we pull up the silage tarps. Um, this works well on the, um, it works well enough on the large scale. I'll compare it in a moment to, to other options. Um, but on the home scale use, you've got kind of advantages and disadvantages to smothering versus solarizing. Frankly, in most cases, I find on the home scale, smothering is often the way to go. Um, there's some really good advantages there. There's some disadvantages. You can see them here. I'm starting to run a little late, so I'm going to kind of move through. Um, but if anyone wants some more information, feel free to reach out with questions. Um, but in general, lay down your cardboard, put some organic material on top, and you can plant into it next season. Or if you top it with topsoil, you can plant into it immediately. Final option is herbicides. Um, there's a lot of problems associated with herbicides. There's also a lot of reasons why people still use herbicides. Um, and I can tell you from this experiment we did here, we did this, this silage tarp meadow. This cost us about eight times what it would have cost to do an herbicide treatment. It's taken two years right now, and I don't think it's actually going to be effective for at least the mugwort. I think it'll do well on the bittersweet. Um, and that's why herbicide is still used so regularly. I can do the same job for an eighth of the price in half the time and more effectively. Um, there's obviously issues associated with herbicides. Um, you know, it's not just, oh, herbicides are the better option. There's problems. Um, but this is, this is why it's still a tool in the toolbox and why a lot of people like to work with them. Um, they can be effective on the large scale in a way where these can't be. Um, that five acre meadow in, in silage tarps cost me $2,800. And that's just the cost of the silage tarps. That's not the cost of the sandbags, the sand to fill the bags, the labor, the time, all those other things. And eventually I've got five acres of plastic that is going into a landfill somewhere. So it's not a silver bullet, um, but it's an option. Okay, final uh, kind of wrapping it all up before I wanna open this up to questions. This is the how to in quick succession. First one is decisions. What are your goals? What are your resources? What works for you? Because every one of the sites is going to require something a little bit different. 
Second stage is murder. Um, remove your current lawn. How do you remove your lawn? What methods are you going to go through? Are you digging it up? Are you using a sod cutter? Are you doing any of the things I mentioned today? Timeline, you know, a season, maybe two, but probably a season. Stage three is what I like to call the initial establishment, and this is where things really start getting different. Um, if you're sowing seed, most of that's done in fall, depending on what you're sowing. If it's a little blue stem, you could do it in spring. Um, but your eco lawns, your clover, your native meadows and grasslands, this is mostly fall sowing. If you're planting plugs or divisions, you're likely going to be doing that in spring. You could do that, frankly, in the middle of summer, as long as you can water the living daylights out of it. You can plant a lot of these in fall. Um, the one thing I'll say is plugs, if planted late in fall, have a tendency to frost heave. So you want to make sure you plant them well in advance of the first frost. And then stage four is your early establishment. Um, so a lot of these plants don't need any watering once they're established, but before they're established, you want to make sure to keep them well watered. Um, weeding as needed, depending on the species, what you're doing, how you prep your soil, you might need to do little to no weeding or you might need to do a lot of weeding. Um, the amount of weeding you need to do in the long term becomes next to nothing, but you need to help these plants to get established. Um, and stage five is to just watch and to not really worry anymore about your lawn that needed mowing all the time and needed all this extra care. It becomes a whole lot easier at this point. Um, my strawberry lawn at Norcross got weeded for, um, they, they estimated they probably took about an hour to weed it last year. We didn't weed it at all this year. We didn't mow it or water it or fertilize it at all this year. And it looks fantastic. It looks like this picture. Okay. And final thoughts, um, the question, you know, I tell people to kill their lawns. They think I want to kill every lawn out there. There are plenty of places where lawns still make a lot of sense. Um, some of these might be able to turn into lawn alternatives, depending. I think a farmer's market could probably yeah, be a strawberry idea. lawn. I think the soccer field is probably going to be a lawn, you know, a traditional lawn to one extent or another for a good long while. Um, but we could treat it better in many cases. Um, it's these things that I look at and say, what is the point? Why do we have a solid acre of lawn in front of this, you know, kind of funny looking house there? Or on the other end of the spectrum, I mean, that picture is from Cambridge, Massachusetts, not too terribly far from me. What is the point of a lawn that takes up 10 square feet? You know, I think it's just a lack of knowledge of what else could be done there. It's like, I got this postage stamp. I guess I'll put in a lawn because I don't know what else to do. Um, but clearly it's not doing anything for us. That could be something else. That could be a vegetable garden. So the final conclusion is do what works for you. Um, find what works on your site, because what you do in this top picture versus what you do in the bottom are two very different things. How much you use your lawn, what your conditions are, what your resources are, how much time and effort and all these things come into it. Um, so that's where you, you take everything I've given you today, find what works for you, and put it to use on your own home landscape. With that in mind, I'm a little over time, not terribly, um, but I'm happy to hang out and take questions. I wanna thank you all again for, for bringing me out today or, or having me at least listening to me from a distance from Illinois, not from Ohio. I'll talk to Ohio some other time. Um, and, and if we've got questions, um, feel free to bring them on. Thank you again. Thank you, Dan. I think you've inspired all of us to take a better look at what we have. There are some questions um, and I wanna let everybody know I did send out the chart. Great, thank you. And it, it's also on our calendar as an attachment. So if you didn't get the email, check our calendar. Um, could you repeat the name of the grass for shade? I think it's the first one, the Pennsylvania sedge. Yep, Pennsylvania sedge. It's technically a sedge, not a grass. It's, it's really the same darn thing, but you know, does taxonomists like to argue about these things? Um, Pennsylvania sedge, it's, if you want to get botanical, it's Carex Pennsylvanica. That's Carex with an X, not carrots, like the things that we eat that Bugs Bunny ate. Um, it's available on that handout. You'll see it there. Or if you just type Pennsylvania sedge into Google, you'll find it. It's a great plant. Uh, somebody mentioned they saw a wild strawberry yard in Arlington Heights near the downtown area. Nice. And they're wondering if it attracts rodents. Um, it attracts chipmunks and squirrels and birds. I've seen them plenty. Um, you know, I, I would think that if you're, um, if you're in the middle of the city and you've got a lot of rats around, they're probably going to eat your strawberries. Um, but I have put in a lot of strawberry lawns and I have not seen any increase in rodent activity. I've not seen any increase in tick activity either. Um, they, they appear to build more of an ecosystem. And especially if you're in an area where you can start building more of an ecosystem, you start bringing in a lot of predators as well. So, you know, you get your chipmunks, but you also get your hawks and the hawks eat the chipmunks. 
Um, that's something you're not going to get in the middle of suburbia or the middle of the city, um, but it's something you start getting if you're on the outskirts and can start seeing a little more of a full ecosystem. Um, but I've not had any rodent issues with strawberry lawns, and I put in quite a few of them at this point. Now, is there a strawberry plant that is an actual weed? Because I have these in my yard, and I thought they were a weed. This is probably the plant. Um, this is a vigorous spreader. It is, it's, that's why it can handle all the abuse that I mentioned that it can handle. Um, there, are, there are at least two native strawberries and one plant called the mock strawberry, which is not a strawberry. Um, but if you've got a plant that looks like a strawberry that has a white flower, not yellow, and produces a little strawberry, then you probably have wild strawberry. It's a very common native plant. Um, and you know, if, if you don't want it in an area, you call it a weed. And if you're me, then I call the lawn a weed and say the wild strawberry is what I want. Um, but this isn't a, a rare species. This isn't something that's hard to find. If, if you think you've got it, you probably do. Okay. Um, somebody said here the fertilizer guy pitched aerating and overseeding, told him to do it in the spring and lawn looks lush enough. How often do you really need to take care of the real compaction? So if your lawn looks lush, you don't need to do it. It's that simple. Um, you know, fertilizer and aeration is a solution to a problem. But if the lawn's growing well, you don't have a problem. Um, it's, you know, you keep in mind that this is how the guy makes his money. So there's, there's some kind of ulterior motives there. They love to sell fertilizer and aeration. It's a service. You know, it, it puts their kids through college. Um, but both aeration and fertilizer are both solutions to issues that if you don't have, there's no need to pay for or do. Um, over fertilization is a problem, can cause a, a lot of additional problems. Never heard of over aeration. I'm sure it's possible, um, but it tends to be expensive um, if you're having someone do it. So unless you see a reason, if you've got thin areas, if the lawn is failing, if you're seeing issues, that's where these are often decent solutions. Um, but as you describe, if the lawn looks good, there's absolutely no need to fertilize or aerate. Um, the more you fertilize, the faster the lawn's going to grow and the more you need to then mow your lawn. Um, I love slow growing lawns. It's kind of the whole point behind the, those fescue mixed lawns is they grow so slowly, you really don't need to mow them much at all. Um, but, you know, I don't know, some people like mowing and, and we've been told we need to fertilize regularly, um, but it's not true. Someone wants to know what's better for killing weeds, the cardboard or the solarizing? It depends entirely on your conditions. Um, I find the, the cardboard is more often the better option because the, the solarizing needs just the right conditions. It needs full sun, absolutely no shade, and it needs, it doesn't work well in very dry soils. That, that steam is a part of it. So if you've got, you know, traditional average soils and full sun, you can go the, the solarizing route. Um, I often like smothering because assuming we're going cardboard and putting some organic material on top, it actually builds healthy soils and then you can plant more varied things in it. Um, it requires a lot of material though, whereas you know the, the solarizing is just that piece of plastic and you don't have to add a whole bunch of material. Um, that being said, smothering is organic. It's biodegradable. Nothing goes into the, you know, into the, the dumpster eventually. Um, and with solarizing, we're talking about a, a single use plastic. Um, so there really, there's no one is better than the other. It really depends on your conditions and your goals. Someone's asking what to do with the fallen leaves in the autumn. Um, again, depending on your conditions. So if we've got one of the native lawns out there, you don't need to do anything at all. Um, Carex pennsylvanica is actually an understory species. That's a Pennsylvania sedge. It likes having leaves on it. As they rot, it'll grow right through them and they feed the lawn. Wild strawberry, same thing. That stuff, as we've found out, is, is practically a weed. It can handle, you know, down leaves, no problem, including dense layers of them. It'll grow right through them. Um, a lot of the matrix species on that list are, are very happy with leaves. If you're talking about a traditional lawn, um, the best thing you can do is to literally just mow those leaves and leave them right in place. Don't, don't put them in the bag. Don't take them away. Just mow them and mulch them. Um, that will break them down much more quickly. And then the traditional lawn will absorb those as nutrients and there's less of a need for fertilizer. Um, leaves are, are really quite valuable. Um, that being said, when I don't need to mow leaves, I prefer not to because leaves are also habitat. There's a lot of caterpillars in those leaves. There's a lot of chrysalis in those leaves and there's a lot of eggs of caterpillars in those leaves and mowing them tends to destroy that. Um, so if I can leave the leaves, I do. Um, and if I need to mow the leaves, then I do. It's, it's really, it's trade-offs. 
So going back to the strawberry, so you're saying the one with the yellow flowers you don't want. The ones you want are the ones with the white flower. Yeah, so the yellow flowers is the mock strawberry. It's it's not the native strawberry. It's, it's a non-native species. It tends to be weedy. It probably would make a pretty decent lawn alternative, but it doesn't have really any ecological value. Um, whereas the native strawberries have the white flower, they have a berry. The mock strawberry has a berry that looks like a strawberry, but tastes like nothing at all. Like you literally put it in your mouth and you're, you're like, where did it go? And you're biting it and there's just nothing there. Um, whereas our native strawberries taste wonderful. Um, they're, they're, they're tart, but they're sweet. And the flavor can really vary depending on the season. Um, but they're, they're really quite good. But they all have a white flower. Um, there's one very, very common native strawberry, the wild strawberry for Gary Virginiana. And then there's a strawberry that's significantly less common. It's not a rare species, but it's just less common. And that's Fragaria vesca, um, usually called the woodland strawberry, which is a, a really poor name for it. It doesn't grow in woodlands, um, but it's, it's a lot less of a speedy grower. Um, it would probably make a pretty nice looking lawn, but it would never handle the abuse that the wild strawberry can handle. Um, the reason I love that wild strawberry is it is the most abuse tolerant lawn alternative I've got. Um, you can do anything to it that you would do to a traditional lawn and it comes back for more every time. All right. Someone wants to know if you plant it, you, can you plant that without killing the whole lawn area? That spreads, so it will take over your lawn, correct? It does spread, but if your lawn is vigorous and healthy and you're putting in baby strawberry plants, they're not going to take over the, the lawn. Um, they'll, they'll grow in thin areas. If your lawn's doing poorly, then the wild strawberry could probably just get planted and take over. Um, but I've tried exactly that in a couple situations where the lawn was healthy. And what I ended up was a lawn with some strawberry mixed into it. And it was definitely a, a good step. It was, you know, there's a lot of ecology included in that strawberry, but the lawn's still growing like a lawn and still needs to get mowed regularly and still needs everything else. Um, so, you know, if you really want to go the kind of the wild strawberry route in terms of a wild strawberry lawn or patch or whatever we want to call it, you need to kind of clear out that lawn to begin with. Okay, someone wants to know how you feel about hairy bitter crust. They have a lot of it. And would you hand pull it out or just leave it? So there's a bunch of different bitter cresses out there. There's some native ones. There's some non-native ones that are not problematic. And there's at least two that are invasive. Um, and I'm not as familiar with your exact area to tell you whether or not hairy bitter cress is invasive. That one is on the Massachusetts watch list, as in it's potentially invasive. It's also one that, um, that can be managed with regular mowing, which if you've got a big patch of it is often a lot easier than trying to pull out individuals. Um, you gotta interrupt it from producing seed. It's actually a short lived plant, but it's very good at producing seed and new ones are constantly coming. So if you can interrupt that seed production, which requires regular mowing, um, then you can get on top of it and you can start kind of working on something else. Um, that being said, plants like that and a lot of these others get smothered just as easily as lawn. So lay the cardboard down on top, put your strawberries on top of that, and you're good to go and you don't have to keep worrying about the hairy bitter crest. Do we have more questions? Um, someone wants to know what's more beneficial, mulch or untreated traditional lawn? I don't know. It would probably untreated traditional lawn or mulch. They're pretty much, they're both as useless in terms of beneficial. Neither one is beneficial at all. Um, you know, a big pile of mulch is not really doing anything ecologically. And untreated traditional lawn is not doing anything ecologically. Um, both of them are permeable, so they're not going to cause major runoff problems, but neither one is good at filtering water. So if you've got torrential downpour or steep situations, they're both going to be as poor. Neither one is a good option. They're both a better option than a traditional treated lawn, but I wouldn't use the word beneficial to describe either one. Uh, that was the last question. Um... Dana, would you like to tell people about the Prospect Heights Natural Resource Commission's um, program, Mow It or Don't Grow It, Don't Mow It? Grow It, Don't Mow It. Um, sure. Um, part of uh, what we do in uh, Prospect Heights is we have a program called Grow It, Don't Mow It. And if residents are willing to make a commitment to come out and volunteer for the long term, 
with the, with the Natural Resources Commission, we're willing to work with them to establish naturalized areas in their lawns. So it's, uh, we've had a lot of people take advantage of that. Uh, it's been a terrific um, recruiting tool for us to get new volunteers. And um, we've increased native habitat immensely here because of it. Thank you, Dana. Thank, yeah, you, you, can, Dana. Uh, Thank you, Dana. You can reach out to us at info at phnrc.com. Thank you, Dan, for a wonderful you, Dan, for a wonderful trip. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you again for having me out. It's really been nice to talk to you all. I hope you can get something out of it. If anyone ends up killing their lawn and doing something else, uh, send me a picture. I love seeing success stories. And if it fails, tell me what went wrong. We can all learn from it. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, once again, I wanna let you know that the next Nature Speaks is in January and we have Kevin Green, Kevin, cannot pronounce his last name, but he will be here January 26th and he's talking about flooding and water management. So join us for that. Thank you again, Dan, and have, have a good evening, everybody. Thanks, Terry. Have a good one, everyone. Nice talking to you all.